of what's been happening in South Texas. So as yesterday, we had uh, another conference and they did amazing, the comments that were shared with the group. Today, we're gonna talk a little bit more about which, what each of these individuals are doing, specifically not only for South Texas, but the state of Texas. So we're gonna talk about things having to do with education, we're gonna talk about industry, we're gonna talk about the future of South Texas. So we couldn't have asked for a better group of individuals to be here. It's very informal. At the end of our discussion, we are gonna leave time for questions. So if you have any questions, please go ahead and jot them down. And if we do have time following our presentation, we'll go ahead and, uh, and, uh, and make sure that they're able to answer. Okay, so we shared some of these, a lot of these things are very informal. It's very open discussion. So at any time, if any of you gentlemen wanna go ahead and chime in, certainly do so. so as you know, we have folks that are representing industry here with us today. And I, the first question that I have, and I'm gonna start with you, Mr. Colossus, okay? Because I don't want you to think I forgot about you. <laughs> but in what ways do you see education playing a role in transforming the region and enhancing economic development? You're an educator. Julian, thank you. I, uh, I did teach uh, a couple of courses at UT San Antonio on economic development. Uh, I, you know, I'm a native of West Laco, first of all, so it's good to be home. And uh, I think uh, Imo Milano, my classmate, Dr. Milano, I think our 10-year high school reunion was held in this room, right? I think a few years ago. Uh, but speaking of education, um, I'm proud that the Rio Grande Valley uh, has a medical school uh, and has a uh, flagship assets uh, that the uh, state has invested in through the uh, University of Texas Permanent University Fund. That was not the case. Uh, when I went to college, uh, although I did go to, to Pan American University for a couple of summer classes, I, I had to move to Austin to get the kind of college education that uh, everyone in the Valley deserves. And now the quality is the same. And then obviously there are other institutions here also. Education is a great equalizer in society. Uh, if you do not have a job, if you do not have a good income, uh, if you feel that you don't have an equal uh, role in society, um, it's because you have not uh, pursued the opportunities that are available to all Americans to pursue the American dream through the free enterprise system that rewards people who work hard and are competitive. Uh, some people win and some people don't win as much. And so you have to do the things that people aren't willing to do. And that's to get an education, to invest in yourself. And I'm very proud of, of the investments the state of Texas has made and the Rio Grande Valley leaders themselves, everyone in this room, especially the, the chamber, the Hispanic chamber. So for me, that is the great equalizer in society. That is what has given me uh, the good fortune of having a quality of life. And I'm proud to be back here to talk about, uh, of course, the importance of the economy because it will go through the Latino community for the future. And thank you for that. Glenn, I, I also wanna share uh, and echo what uh, Ramiro said, but but I wanted your, your, your input on yesterday you had an opportunity to visit and last night you had an opportunity to have dinner with Dr. Solis and he's got one of his trustees here with us today. I mean, how is the how is our education in South Texas enhancing our economic development? Is that is that why we're able to attract the LNGs and SpaceX and all that? Uh, absolutely. And I want to thank you for all that you've done. Uh, you were a model uh, Texas workforce commission commissioner and the number one issue that I hear when I go around the state doesn't matter where where I am I could be in the RGV or any anywhere in the state it's workforce and it's skills and it's and it's education and uh, it was a great privilege to have the chance to participate at yesterday's conference so I also want to thank uh, Cynthia and her team this is I, I Massey and I are big baseball fans. This is a double header. This is a lot of programming <laughs> in a short period of time, and it's and it's very very uh, impressive. Uh, but but making sure that the RGV has the educational institutions that it needs uh, is critically important. And at the dinner uh, last night 
with, with Dr. Solis, uh, who does a phenomenal job, uh, we had uh, a very robust uh, discussion over uh, the importance of, of things like dual enrollment. Uh, getting uh, getting young people uh, actually uh, I, I believe it might now they told me there would be no math but I, I believe that there's about 20 percent or so of the degrees awarded now uh, maybe it's a little bit higher than 20 percent are students coming out of high school I mean think about that for a second we know that those students who are graduating with a set of skills and and a degree that is, uh, that is very useful and is marketable, what does this mean? For the rest of their lives, they're gonna have great opportunities, whether it's to continue in education or to continue in, in, in the different areas of, of the economy. Uh, final point here, and to me this is really, you also have, uh, as mentioned, uh, the medical school and, 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 and other great uh, higher education uh, offerings is how dynamic this economy is and how it needs uh, this, these types of education offerings. We right now, Texas is the number one economy in the country, which means it's the number one in the world. But we right now, here in the RGB, we are in the fastest growing part of Texas. So we absolutely need an education system that meets uh, those uh, demands and, and, and needs. Massey, you've experienced uh, multiple years under different governors, our education and how it's transformed in South Texas. You just heard Mr. Cavazos talk about the medical school, but not only are we, prog are we producing quality doctors, but we're also now in apprenticeship programs, IT, that you're very familiar with. Have, have you seen the educational system enhanced and how has it transformed economic development in South Texas? Great, uh, well, again, I would, I would they did a great job as, as a Texas Workforce Commissioner. That's a big job. I mean, there's a lot of work that goes on. People don't understand. They think the jobs that show up and they get funded. And so I think uh, what you've done, if I have to recognize a couple of things before I start, what is Andy Garcia, Marisa Castro was sitting in the corner of this office. So, uh, there they are. And then um, you know, I'm the state chair of the chamber. And um, I have a regional chair. I have the chair who represents me here in El Centro Contreras. The RGB, he's Mr. RGB, and, uh, and then of course uh, Trustee Alcantar, and of course President Solis. So when George W. Bush became governor, he called me. He says, "I want you to serve. I want you to serve." Okay, sorry. Okay, sorry. Uh, he said, "I want you to serve on the Board of Regents." And I said, "Sure, I'll, I'll accept." Is it working? Yeah, I think it's over. Okay. Hello. Okay, this one is. Sorry. Is it better? <laughs> Switching. Is it the Yes? Okay, I think it's working. This, yeah. this, this, this. All right. Okay. All right, so restart my story. Where was I? <laughs> so so the governor called me and said, I want you to serve in the Board of Regents. I said, sure. And I hung up the, the phone and I went back to ask my partner, my business partner, said, uh, what's a regent? I had no clue. And what I learned is that the appointees of the, of the Board of Trustees, like uh, Trustee Alcantar here, we, we actually managed the, the, the system. When I got into the Board of Regents, I will tell you that it was a system that didn't focus on Latino graduations. I was real concerned because Latinos were having to get their uh, financial aid like in the sixth week, they were dropping out, and nobody cares. So uh, Commissioner, I don't even know, but I have another full-time non-paying job I'm the national chair of a group called Excellence in Education. And what we do is we focus on the intentionality of graduating Latinos from Hispanics or institutions like South Texas College. And if a school can come to us and prove to us that they're intentional in graduating Latino students, or all students, not just Latinos, all schools, we award them the seal of Excellencia. There are today 600 HSIs, Hispanic institutions in the country, with 400 emerging soon, because there's so many Latino population, that in the next two or three years, there'll be a thousand Hispanic institutions. We award the Seal of Excelencia to those who are outstanding. Out of the almost a thousand, there's only 39 that ever achieved the Seal, and one is South Texas College. I think it's a pleasure to applaud.
So, you know, when I became chair of the state chamber, I told Lynn that one of the things we want, we're going to do is we're going to focus on community colleges and outcomes. You know, in, in a prior uh, lifetime, community college would say, how many do you have in your, in your campus? Well, I have 100,000 times a formula here to check. But what was important is how, you know, how do we get more people to work, right? And the things that we work with the Texas Workers Commission on, certificates of value, how many dental assistants, how many welders, how many can work logistics, how many can read a blueprint. And those are certificates of value because as we relocate businesses into the, into the RGV, people who are coming here, I mean, yeah, there's great people down here, and the best tortillas in South Texas, okay? <laughs> but however, they want a workforce, right? And so South Texas College and the other schools here in the RGV, are, are preparing the workforce, right? Because if not, these companies are very, very astute at what they do and where they look. And if they don't find a population of educated professionals or of educated workforce, they do not come. So I think what you guys are doing here is a great job. And I think that has become, a, you guys are a magnet now for attracting a business to South Texas. Thank you for those comments. Glenn, uh, maybe we can, uh, we can, uh, Glenn, so let's piggyback off what um, on what was said by Massey. What is the future of South Texas look like? I mean, you've been traveling the state of Texas. We're very unique. Yesterday, you made reference to the ports of entry we had. You made reference to our economy. You made reference to how business friendly South Texas was. How are we different from the other parts of the state? Well, the industries of tomorrow are locating here in the RGV. One uh, obvious one is what's going on uh, with, with, with SpaceX and, and on, on, the, on the space side of, of, of things. Uh, to, to me, uh, you have a lot of people all over Texas. I have very good friends that love to come and, and watch the, the, the different launches. But if you think about the skills that are, that are required, the engineering skills, the mechanical skills, uh, it's, 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 pretty, it's pretty awesome. And then you think of, uh, so Massey, I'm gonna try out some new material here. Uh, Nearshoring, you think of logistics, you think of the fact that Mexico now is our top trading partner, Canada's two, uh, China's three. Anyone upset that China slipped to number three? And you would have said that Mexico is now number one, or friend, neighbor, and ally. So you think about nearshoring. If there's one area that both parties can agree on, and it may only be one area, is that China is the top economic and security threat to the United States of America. So how do we combat that? We combat that by building a stronger economy, nearshoring, and reshoring. And I want to think, well, I can't say that I'm from the RGB. I'm just a Jewish guy from the Bronx. Uh, I did, we are very lucky that we have Julia Musquez, who is born in Brownsville, educated in Brownsville. And her, her, her dad operates a, a, a massive uh, complex uh, in uh, Matamoros that employs 3,500 people. And that's helping Texas and other US businesses thrive. Because in today's world, we build stuff together. So I'd say that just two areas right off the jump where, where South Texas and the RGV in particular have, have a big advantage is in uh, the space area and all of the uh, areas uh, surrounding logistics. 81% of the goods that cross from Mexico into the United States, about 450 billion, pass through Texas. And this area of the state has more ports of entry than any other area. You know, Glenn, we've been following you as far as the comments that you're making at other venues, and, and thank you for that. I mean, you always seem to acknowledge the great things that are happening in South Texas. That's why we were excited that you were gonna be here. And then as a bonus, we were able to bring Massey Betty out. And then on top of that, we brought Ramiro Galasso's with us. So just so that you know, this is really awesome that you have these three individuals here in South Texas at one time. We were very fortunate that, that Glenn referenced Julia earlier, who's an attorney, but her dad has a maquila, and you said something yesterday that I thought was a little interesting. Uh, almost every airplane has what? Tell us something that maybe uh, folks in this room may not know. So I believe it's a huge number, something like 80% of the air, airline seats that you're sitting on are connected to uh, her dad's uh, facility. So yeah, if was the next time you're on a plane, uh, yes. thank Julia. Yes. And they're very comfortable.
but, but, but the land. So Romito, the same question. So Glenn gave us the perspective of what happens at the state level and what people perceive of the Rio Grande Valley. You travel nationally, so what are they saying about what's happening in South Texas and how do we differ from other parts of the country? Julian, thank you again for your leadership and for moderating this panel. Uh, we, uh, we have 300 uh, economic development groups that are members of the U.S. Hispanic Chamber of Commerce. The majority of them are Latinos. Uh, we have chambers, uh, uh, I run the San Antonio Hispanic Chamber of Commerce. I want to commend Cynthia for running the Rio Grande Valley Hispanic Chamber for 24 years. Let's give her a round of applause. Uh, but uh, if, if I ask anyone here, we grew up in the valley and we were all entrepreneurs. We all worked hard. Uh, our, our parents uh, had businesses or, or farms or restaurants. And, and, and so um, to answer your question, people see the area between Austin, San Antonio, all the way down to Monterrey and Saltillo. And some economists believe that it is the number one spot for economic development in the world right now. When you consider the approval of the USMCA, Temec, uh, the fact that Texas's largest trading partner is Mexico, and now it's the US's uh, largest trading partner, uh, Glenn said it well. They're not only our economic partner, they're our friends, they're our family, they're our neighbors, and they're our allies, and, and who better than to work with someone right next to you than someone across the world that's trying to beat you up every day on the military side. So what we hear is uh, people are impressed with Texas. It's the limited regulation. It's the fact that this state is now 40% Latino. It is the number one population in the state. Um, it's a state that also is very independent. As we all know, we, we don't always get it right. We all know that uh, nobody's perfect. Uh, but uh, I think this state uh, embraces economic development. I was proud to bring Toyota to Texas uh, and the manufacturing plant to San Antonio when I was head of economic development, uh, 4,000 jobs. Now those same suppliers are doing business in Guanajuato, in Mexico. And you know this as the former head of workforce development. And not only that, it created a, a, a crystallizing effect because then we brought the national office from New York to Plano, another 12,000 high paying jobs. So uh, the Japanese have a saying that if when you drink the water, don't forget who dug the well. Uh, and, and Can you I, say that in Japanese? Uh, <laughs> no, I, I, I used to when I was head of economic <laughs> development. Um, but uh, we had green tea when they came to visit us, we didn't have coffee, and that was the difference makers. We understood the culture, and so what I'm saying is the, the beauty of, of what I'm hearing across the country, and I was in New York on Friday, uh, uh, you know, with Google, and, and I'm, I'm, I was, uh, had the fortune of being at the White House for the 12 year anniversary of DACA, and, and so it, it's too much travel. I would not recommend it to anyone, but you have to show up. And, 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 you know, people from the Rio Grande Valley show up in, in, in big numbers. I want to thank these two gentlemen on the panel with me. They're dear friends. They're, they're great mentors of mine. And, and we need each other to be successful. You know that. And uh, so anyway, I, I believe that everyone here is at the right place at the right time to create economic development the way it's never been done before. I agree. Great comments. Massey, I have a question for you. So. Being on the board, Tech Association of Business, and then having Sergio Contreras here, so thank you, Sergio, uh, for all the work you're doing, and especially representing South Texas. Massey, I'm, I'm curious, um, what are some, we, we talked a little bit about what's happening maybe nationally, what are some of the things that, that you're charged with that you're gonna be bringing up maybe during the upcoming legislative session? I know Glenn's been certainly involved. I, I see him everywhere. He certainly has the governor's ear, and so do you. I'm curious. What are some of the priorities and things you guys are working on for this upcoming legislative session? Okay, great question. Before I do that, I do want to recognize Cynthia Sakolinski for the great job she does and the chair, Sarah. And uh, yeah, there's only a, 
Three women, three women that can make me jump. My mother and, and two Cynthia's. My wife Cynthia and that Cynthia. And, uh, well, if, it, if I'm not mistaken, they didn't ask us to be here. They told us to be yeah, here. I was, I, I was voluntold to them. And uh, I do have roots here in the valley. My prima and prima in the back. They're in my valley, so we're uh, I have blood here in the valley. Uh, I will tell you that... Um, you know, being the charity, be all, and Glenn and I are forced to be almost the expert in almost any business topic at any given time. Uh, you know, on on Saturday we are launching to Israel with uh, with a handful of legislators to talk about cybersecurity. We're talking about desalinization plants. We're talking about healthcare. We're talking about a security. So, so we have to become kind of experts. And one of our legislators is an expert on AI. So we're that's a uh, Giovanni Crepillion. Oh, by the way. I mean, I want to remind you, who was the chairman of the Department of Economic Development when you did the Toyota plant? Yo. I think it was Massey. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, so and, and, and the governor was Rick Perry. That's right. So I've known Ramiro for a long time. He's worked for Levi, right? Levi in the chamber. And so great economic developer. And of course, you know, when I became chair of TAB, we had to terminate uh, the, the president. We interviewed people, and I was Googling around who has the best chamber of commerce that we can copy from. I said, this Arizona is looking pretty good. And so, lo and behold, the president of the Arizona Chamber of Commerce applies, Glenn Hammer. Yeah. They're like, oh my God, he walked to the door and said, we're done, erase the board, you know, the road said. So, uh, I will tell you that, uh, Glenn, I look confused. He's a Brooklyn Jew and go to Mexico. <laughs> I'm Mexican and I've been to my seventh trip to Israel. So we're a little confused. So, Commissioner, back to your question. Uh, uh, so there's a lot of issues. As you know, we had a... We had, exactly, it's not material. We had the House Bill 8, the largest economic development bill that we've had in the state of Texas passed in the last session. We're gonna have to tweak that because you, know, you pass these bills and then you, you go through the execution of the language, you find that there's some unintended consequences, so we'll have to do that. House Bill 18, which deals with community colleges and, and the performance of community colleges, we're gonna have to go back and tweak that. We're under, we're under a threat from the Chinese. You know, they are out going around the world buying all the raw materials to make semiconductors. I mean, they're, they're trying to get ahead of the game. Uh, I heard this morning that uh, the Chinese are ahead of us on uh, nuclear by about seven years. So that's a threat, it's a security threat to this country. See, if you look at your appliances, your cars, they all have semiconductors. So in the last session, we passed a bill to open up an office in Taiwan to be uh, be there. Taiwan makes 80% of the advanced semiconductors for the whole world. And if the, if, if the Chinese invade Taiwan, guess what's gonna happen? And then they're, they're cornering the market on, on products. So we look at those things and we look at it as a, as, how to, as a fixed business. And how do we get incentives? We have the largest tax cut in the history of any country, in the state, 18 billion, was the number last year? That's bigger than some of the state's economies. Uh, and so, uh, Glenn and I were uh, with uh, a group of senators, and one was a former governor of Florida, and he says, we hate Texas economic development because you guys are kicking our butt. <laughs> and it's a full contact game, I mean, we. We do a lot, and so Glenn and I have been working with Monterrey, we've gone to we've gone to Mexico City, we've met with Claudia Scheinbaum already, we've met the governors of the states. So any given day, we, we look at how it attracts, and then we have to go to the legislature and get the funded, look at things that are good, like for South Texas College, and for business, and for small business, and minority-owned business. Glenn, yeah. would you like to add, um, is there anything, by listening to your stakeholders, I, we really appreciate the fact that you take time on your busy schedule to meet with folks like this. You're picking up ideas, you're pushing for it. Uh, is there anything in particular you'd like to stress? Well, it's a labor of love, and I'm, I'm blessed to get paid for this. This gentleman doesn't get paid for this. So this is his fourth chamber that he has chaired, and he is the best chamber chair in the United States of America. And no one works harder than Massey Murray. So I have to step it up. Uh, what what I'll add is that uh, for the next session, we're always forward looking. I want to thank uh, uh, the the R the entire RGV constellation. And the more uh, Cynthia, the more 
and, and, and Sergio, the more the RGB continues to become a power block, the more successful the region will be. So I just, Daniel and the whole RGB partnership, uh, the whole region is doing a phenomenal job of coming together in a powerful way. And the message is being received and it's, and it's translating into legislative victories on the state level, Massey mentioned. Uh, some of them, we're gonna make a major effort into uh, making sure we have a strong research and development credit, that's going to be the big economic development item uh, next year. This this past regular session, it was making sure we had a property tax uh, uh, recruitment tool, that was, that's the JEDI Act, HB5, and it was because we were able to get 250 plus chambers and economic development groups together that that passed. We're going to have to use that same uh, type of approach to get a good R&D tax credit, and, and I'll just, as a quick aside to that, why this is so important. I have philosophical conversations with my 15-year-old daughter how much chocolate is too much. There's no amount. And it's the same with R&D. We have to do more and more uh, R&D. And on the port side, I, I want to thank uh, our two United States Senators. We've done some different events uh, with Senator Cruz. Uh, Senator Cornyn is a national treasure. Uh, all of the work that Senator Cornyn has done uh, to uh, help our ports of entry and, and Senator Cruz in terms of ex expediting the presidential uh, bridge permitting process. That's going to that's a big yes, deal. Yes, and we know you recently had you were hosting Senator Cornyn. He was recently there in your building. We had a great meeting with, with the senator uh, in 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 D.C. where we were talking about uh, this issue and, and and some of the more difficult border issues. But but as a, a quick aside with. Uh, Massey mentioned uh, Claudia Scheinbaum and what just happened there. It's very important for this region that right off the jump, a very good relationship is established with the next uh, president of Mexico. And we're gonna be leading, Julia is leading this effort with David Zapata in our office, who's uh, from Eagle Pass. Uh, but we're gonna do a, a massive trip to Mexico City around uh, uh, the inaugural, which is October 1, around the premier uh, event that brings together thought leaders in Canada, the United States, and Mexico to advance the North American economic region, and that's our friend Enrique Parrott of, uh, with the U.S. Mexico Foundation, so it's called the North Capital Forum. But it's very important that the RGV shows up in a major, major way. And and my final point on this, what's interesting, uh, AMLO, as her, as her the current president is known, uh, did everything and anything to. There's no other way to put it. Uh, to I'm trying to be as diplomatic as possible, to not engage with the business community. Uh, so far, President-elect Scheinbaum is doing the exact opposite. She just had a major event with the leading Mexican business groups, including the ones that the Texas Association of Business, thanks to our uh, international division chair, Rolando Pablos, for, former great secretary of state. We've signed MOUs with a number of these different Mexican business organizations, and we are committed to establishing a good relationship with Dr. Scheinbaum. I, I believe that's very, very important to the to the economy of the RGB. Thank you. Rubino, would you like to add to that? I mean, you're now at the at the federal level. Uh, what's your take on our new president-elect that's going to be taking, obviously, her position sometime in October? What do you foresee the future? Well, I, I agree with uh, Massey, and, and by the way, Massey is a former chairman of the board of the United States Hispanic Chamber of Commerce. So thank you, Massey, for your leadership. And when I took this job six years ago, he was the first one that called and, and lent a hand and uh, supported me. So thank you, Massey, for helping me be successful because we were rebuilding an organization that had lost its way. But getting to Mexico, I'm very impressed with the president-elect. Uh, she um, is a scientist. Uh, she's the first woman. President, so Mexico beat the United States uh, in is electing a first uh, Latina or female president. Uh, she went to graduate school at UC Berkeley, so she understands uh, how this nation works. And speaking of education, and, and, and Dr. Solis, thank you for your leadership. Again, that's the great equalizer, and she will understand the importance of, of education for economic development. And she's a, a secular Jew. So she understands all faiths, all religions, and, and uh, she speaks perfect English, uh, better than some of the folks I went to high school with in Westland. <laughs> and uh, so I, I just, uh, 
I'm very impressed. We, a year ago, had a trade mission to Mexico, and we did open an office there of the United States Hispanic Chamber of Commerce. Uh, uh, we, we met with both of the candidates at the time. But what impresses me about her is that I believe she's going to build her own path. Uh, she is pro-economic development, uh, uh, and, and uh, I agree uh, with the work that TAB is doing to uh, open those doors immediately. Uh, we look forward to, to being there for the inauguration. Uh, the thing that AMLO did that, you, you know, that, that I am still um, very disappointed is the world-class airport that was called the Polígono uh, had almost was almost 70% complete. Multi-billion dollar project was gonna put Mexico uh, City on the map. It was gonna be the state-of-the-art airport in the world, like major countries have built state-of-the-art airports. His first decision when he got into office was to kill that project. And we had toured it already uh, when I visited, uh, when I was at the, at the San Antonio Hispanic Chamber. So um, it was a lot of money wasted and thrown away uh, and I agree with, with Glenn and Massey that uh, we, we have uh, a great opportunity with this new president. Uh, the last point I want to make is, is that uh, this is our time uh, as uh, Hispanic Americans. We're 20% of the population. Uh, we are the fifth largest economy in the world at $3.2 trillion. If we were our own nation, these 65 million Latinos who self-identify as Latinos, we, we represent uh, an economy that is larger than, than the economy of the country of India with 1.4 billion people. We're just 65 million, but we already outgun them. And our biggest trade advantage and comparative advantage is the culture, the language, our ability to understand how to do business with each other. And, and I think the Rio Grande Valley is poised perfectly uh, to do business and, and we look forward to at the national level in Washington at our office to working closely with TAB and of course with Senator Cornyn and, and Senator Cruz. We've worked on, on unloading uh, uh, stall uh, projects of four bridges that needed approval between the US and Mexico in partnership with our folks here on the panel. And it was a bipartisan yes. uh, issue. And, and for us, uh, we love to tell people we're not red or blue, we're uh, red, white, and blue, and our favorite color is green. <laughs> Massey, so we've been talking about a lot of the positives that are coming out of Texas. You know, the economy's good, and you know, the unemployment in South Texas continues to improve. I mean, when you and I were in high school, you know, the economy in South Texas was in the high 20s, right? Now we're, we're like in single digits, we're five, we're six percent. I mean, that's amazing, right? But can you share with us maybe some of the challenges that we may that we're encountering that you know maybe we could improve on? Is there anything that just stands out? Uh, yeah, there, there's a couple of things. I mean, I think, but first of all, I want to go back to something that Amito said, and maybe Glenn is that, talk about Claudia Scheinbaum, a very educated uh, climate, climate person. There's probably about five, 10 women in, in this building that could give her a run for her money. I mean, I, I see you guys, and, and there's some sharp women. So Claudia Scheinbaum got nothing on this room, okay? <laughs> man, man, see, you, you're awesome, man. <laughs> <laughs> you know, it's true, man. I'm afraid of my mother. Yeah. Yeah, yesterday I spoke at a men's conference. We're going to make Massey man of the year. <laughs> I spoke at a, a men's conference yesterday and I said that I learned my management skills from my mother because she had six kids and my dad worked six days a week for 12 hours. I mean, there was no, he came home tired and one day off. And my mother had six kids and she learned to manage and discipline. Uh, and to this day, I'm still afraid of my mother. <laughs> so, uh, well, you know, if you look at South, at South Texas, you know, and you look at the, I, I live in Houston, and I sit on the big chamber board. I peer with 23 Fortune 100, com 100 company CEOs. And then look at what we have in Houston, and look at South Texas. You know, look at what is the largest business you have in South Texas. Now you got SpaceX and things that are moving down here. But the thing is, we have to figure out how to attract the, the Rio Grande Valley to site selectors that are looking out across the country saying, hey, I got a new client, he's in Chicago, they're tired of the taxation. California has a $38 billion deficit and they're charged more taxes than business. They, they're leaving. And the Rio Grande Valley is a perfect place to host corporations, right? To come down here because there's a big workforce, 
cost of living is, 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 is not as high as New York or, or California. But I think, it, I think we need more promotion out of the Valley. There, uh, you know, I, had, uh, uh, I connected last night with Mary Villalobos where we talked about the need for a loop to connect the, the, the kind of the, the cities in South Texas. Uh, infrastructure, I mean, it's, it's, you know, there's a lot of road construction, but, can, but continued building an infrastructure. We had an ERCOT uh, person speak at our TB board meeting a couple of weeks ago, and you just don't go and build a massive plant somewhere without get, what's gonna be electricity, what's the drain on electricity, because then you start having blackouts. So I think we need like a little urban planning, to, Sergio, to figure out how the, the Valley can say, hey, we are ready to, we have like 20 shovel rigs, ready sites that we can bring, and then have a, have a familiarization tour, invite site selectors down here and say, wow, we didn't know South Texas had this. They have a workforce, they have a great community college that's, that's, uh, that's uh, graduate students. You know, I, I uh, some of you know, I, 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 you know, I chair the Department of Economic Development for Rick Perry. I probably flew around $100,000 around the world Rick Perry promoting Texas as business. We went to China, we went to Europe, we went to South America, and the question asked, well, how many, how many engineers can you graduate, and how many dental assistants, and how many, and the thing is, we didn't have it, but the thing is, you look at now today, what South Texas College is doing in the RGV, UTRGV, I think it's prime, I think it's promotion. Because this is, you guys are the best secret, come down here, we're all gente, we're all compadres, comadres, we all get along, but we gotta get to the business mode in Houston, we're outbound economic development. We don't wait for people. We're traveling around the world promoting Houston for trade. And we have some great institutions as well. But I think, so Commissioner, I think if, if, if you have to ask one thing, this is the greatest gem that's sitting in Texas. A lot of land available, great workforce. I think just promotion and then work with Senator Cornyn's office, Senator Cruz's office on some of the infrastructure things that we would need to connect and have a power grid. And I think we'll be good to go. What would you like to add, Glenn, to that? The, uh, I should have said the on the energy side, when uh, Julia and I uh, toured the Port of Brownsville, it was, it was really neat to see uh, because part of it is, uh, is they're, they're increasing the capacity to do uh, LNG uh, exports, which is a huge deal, the, the natural gas for the state of Texas, the economy, and, and for the world, and for the people in Europe who don't want to freeze to death in the winter, natural, Texas natural gas is really good. So there is actually another area where we need to make sure that the policies are right and you know, the, the foolish uh, desire on the part of the Biden administration to pause LNG exports is something we should all be participating in, in reversing. And I appreciate that Senator Cornyn has been on top of that. But also part of it was these huge wind blades coming in and, and, and going out. So the, the importance of uh, the energy uh, security uh, for the state of Texas and for the country and for our allies, uh, the, this region of Texas is, is going to play uh, a huge role. And I, I, every point Massey made is right. It's, it's a gem. I also believe that people want to go where the hockey puck is, is, is going. And the fact that this region's population has basically doubled uh, since 1990. The amount of workers have doubled and all of the great things that are going in education. You know that the workforce is going to continue to grow and get more skilled uh, here in this region. We also know it's going to continue to deter deteriorate in terms of population in states like New York, California, and Illinois as people uh, try to get out of there as fast as they can. That would a compliment to Dr. Solis and the trustees that are here because the fact that, that we're hearing that it's not the skilled workers. I mean, you know, before you may have heard that, and I'm not sure if that was the talk, but for Massey, who's been in this type of business for a long time, to say it's really just marketing, what the jewel that you have here that, that South Texas is the best kept secret, you know, that's a compliment to the folks here, the educational partners, the business community. So thank you, uh, Massey, for that. And of course, our delegation that represents us in Austin. Romino, what would you like to add? I mean, you know, you see a lot of things that, that are very successful around the country, but obviously mm -hmm. you, you do also witness that there are some deficiencies. Is there something that you could see that maybe we in the Valley could do to improve not only our, our presence, but is there something that's keeping us from being a Toyota? You know, I, I shared the Toyota incentive package 
about 15, 20 years ago with, uh, at the time, the mayor of McAllen, who's today the county judge. Uh, you know, uh, it, it was a public document uh, and, and Massey was the chair of the Economic Development Group. The irony is at the time, our mayor of San Antonio and our county judge had endorsed the opponent running against uh, Governor Rick Perry. And we were on the short list to recruit Toyota and we were gonna go ask the state for resources. Um, and this was a once in a lifetime uh, $2 billion investment for even for San Antonio. And we had zero automotive manufacturing jobs. But because I grew up in the Valley, uh, uh, I wasn't afraid of, 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 of recruiting them uh, even though we had zero jobs, what we did have was a, a workforce. We did have, we were in the state of Texas and they wanted to say they were building a Tundra in Tacoma in Texas. Yeah. And they also wanted to be near Mexico. And then their sales office was in Houston. And so at the time, uh, I wanna commend the state leadership, especially Massey and Governor Perry, in spite of the fact that the two top elected officials of San Antonio were opposing his reelection, uh, he opened the, the treasury for the city to bring. He told us, we are not going to lose Toyota to Arkansas or Missouri or anyone, because we our proposal, our incentive package, although I shared it with the mayor of McAllen, was five times less, $158 million total, but it was five times less than our nearest competitor. But we overcame that with other uh, opportunities like workforce, like proximity to Mexico. I do wanna say uh, that, that all the issues that, that we've talked about, the thing that we need to fix is uh, immigration. Uh, we in the Valley are caught in the middle of this fight. Some people have never been to the border. We need border security, but right now there is not a pathway to citizenship for anyone. We need to fix that. It's gotta be a bipartisan solution uh, and uh, right now, uh, we have 14 million jobs that are high tech to low tech that are unfilled in the US. And the replacement rate, because baby boomers are retiring, with the exception of Emil and I, uh, <laughs> we are not producing enough Americans organically. We're producing, to replace folks that retire or pass away, you need 2.1 children per family. We are at 1.4 per family in the, in the US. Uh, and so we're gonna have to find that extra workforce from somewhere. And um, so we've gotta fix that problem. And, and that's my, and you know about yes. workforce better. We, they need to be skilled and educated uh, or else we're not gonna, 80% of the jobs of the future require STEM. Uh, and, and so it, we're gonna need a skilled and educated workforce. Uh, I'm also, uh, before we close, I'm so proud of the folks that are talents in the Valley. If I may take a point, a personal privilege, Andrea Cavazos Rodriguez, my first cousin, works here at the Double Tree. Let's give her a round of applause. Uh, thank you, Prima. Um, uh, I so have, she donated everything today. Yeah. I, <laughs> I had a fruit basket in my room, no, I'm just kidding. Uh, I want to also recognize my uh, younger but beautiful brother, Isaac Cavazos. Let's give him a round of applause if you can stand. Uh, he just retired from the U.S. Border Patrol. Uh, thank you, Isaac, for your service. And also want to thank my, my friend, Trey Cardenas, Charles Cardenas III, who I've known since I was three years old. Charles, please stand. Thank you, sir. And these, these folks are are part of that fabric in the Rio Grande Valley that are creating jobs, creating economic development. And so I just, I think the Valley can lead, to answer your question, with our help, to build a, a plan of what's that solution. I don't have the solution. I do know that we need to fix that problem because economies like Japan, economies like Germany, that have said no to immigration laws, have suffered and struggled yes. and are stagnant economies. We are growing at a 14% rate as a, an economy. We're 40% of the global economy, the US, and a big part of that is our community. We need to fix that or else we're gonna slow down our economic development. You know, I, I thank all of you for the comments that you've made. You know, Glenn, I, I, I'm gonna take this opportunity to thank you. You were so easy to work with when I was in Austin. 
And one of the things that I really appreciate with you and Massey is when we would have discussions when we were talking about workforce, how you were open to having discussions about people that have been formerly incarcerated. I mean, that was, that was, I mean, no one does that. No one takes the time to, to reflect on some of the challenges. And, and you were doing it because we needed to fill those jobs that Ramito just said. So I appreciate you doing that. And, I, you know, is there anything that you would like? I know we're closing before we open it up to questions, but is there anything that you guys would like to finish, uh, maybe some closing remarks from each of you, uh, not only about maybe what you're doing, but something maybe that you're most proud of? Well, on the, on the labor side, uh, completely agree. We need a congressional uh, resolution to our immigration system. Uh, you're right that we're not producing enough uh, children. We, I guess we could play more Barry White music and see if that changes the numbers. <laughs> but short of doing that, we need, we need legal immigration. And, it, and it, legal immigration is one of the greatest advantages of the country that the best and the brightest and the hardest working people on the planet want to come here, uh, including, uh, that's what my wife says, she's from Israel, anyway. Uh, but, but it's true, and, and the love that immigrants who come in legally, in particular, have for the country is off the chart. My in-laws buy up all the 4th of July uh, flags. Uh, I, I do think that, uh, I'll be very specific, I do think that uh, the DACA population we have to legalize. Uh, these are Texans, these are people that have been contributing, they're vetted and then some. Uh, but, but we do need uh, border security. It is, it, is a, it is a hazard to this country that we don't know a lot of the people who are coming in and people should not be entering between ports of entry, period. We have ports of entry. If you're flying out, Master, you're flying out, you're not gonna be able to say, I'm just gonna jump TSA, even though I'm sure you have a passport and all this other stuff. So we need, we need a legal system, but we need Congress uh, to set this. And I also believe that within the visa system, there's a ton we can do on the NAFTA visas. Uh, no one is aware of NAFTA visas, by and large, why? Because they work. It's basically a three-year renewable visa that Canadians and, and, and Mexicans can use to work legally in the United States. It covers fields like engineer, engineering, graphic design, uh, design artists, lawyers, a lot of different fields. That probably should be modernized. And here's something that I learned. I'll, I'll end on this, and this gives me optimism, is that there now may be more TN visas used, NAFTA visas, which, by the way, every member of the Texas congressional delegation from right to left and the U.S. senators supported when it unanimously passed and the USMCA received a remote from, uh, from our members of Congress. There are now more TN NAFTA visas in use in the United States, I believe, than H-1B visas. So that's a legal way to help expand our workforce. And as the uh, South Texas, the RGV workforce uh, expands and needs different skills, that could be a good way to complement the outstanding uh, uh, workforce that already exists in this region. Well, thank you, Glenn. That was really good. Thank you for that information. Massey, is there anything you'd like to close uh, today? Uh, yes, Commissioner. And I do want to go back to uh, your point on the Second Chance Coalition. You and I have met in your office when you were a commissioner. I mean, there's Texans who've, who've been incarcerated for things that are not murder, rape, or killing a child. They went to prison for a mistake, and then they come out, right? And they're looking for a great job to rebuild. There's no reason why we can't take these great Texans and put them to work in, in, our, in our practices, get them working with, we're talking to the Texas Department of Licensing to get them electrician licenses. We're talking to uh, uh, these big air conditioning manufacturers about doing trainee programs for these Second Chance Coalition. It's important to us and TV. Thank you, Commissioner, for kicking that off with us. Uh, I, I will say one last thing. I think, um, you know, did I say the grow the largest growing segment of business are Latina? Business, I, I'm just going back to the Latina thing. The Latina are the fastest growing segment in business today, growing faster in any segment of business. We need to focus on the capacity of helping Latinas expand their businesses. We've got to figure that out. Dr. Ricardo Solis, we need to figure out how to teach capacity building, right? Economic development, how to, how to build businesses. Uh, the banks are here willing to learn, to, to, to loan money, uh, and they, they want to do it, but they have to show them the way to get there. So I think there's a capacity building for all businesses to figure out how to grow to a bigger, better business. And then lastly, I mean, this is not business. Please vote. 
I don't care who you vote for. I don't like the two guys running for president, but I'm gonna vote, okay? You have to vote. And if you don't vote, don't complain. You have to get out and get your family or everybody to vote. Get in the poll, the RGV is so strong, but if you don't vote, they don't hear you in DC. Great. That's the next one. Is there anything you'd like to close with? I just, uh, very briefly, um, which is hard for me to say and do, uh, is uh, I just wanna uh, say the three things, and it's been referenced by Massey and Glenn, that small businesses need. They're the lifeblood of our communities. I wanna commend Chairwoman Hammond uh, for her, uh, her business and, and, the, and her sacrifice. It's a lonely business to be an entrepreneur, uh, and literally, um, but Latinas and Latinos over-index. We create more jobs Immigrants create more businesses and jobs than non-immigrants, and Latinos create more businesses, more jobs than, than non-Latinos. Uh, uh, it's in our blood. The, the beauty also is being Hispanic is a state of mind, in my opinion. You can be Jewish, Protestant, Catholic, uh, you know, we're white, we're Asian Latinos, we're, we're Afro-Latinos, uh, you know, different ages, but we're a young population. Uh, we're, we're more highly educated than ever before. Entrepreneurship is, is in our DNA. And, and I, I know that this country was built by the innovation from immigrants. In fact, Latinos got here 128 years and Spanish was the first language spoken, uh, European language, than the folks that landed at Pilgrim, uh, uh, Plymouth Rock in 1610. The irony is you wouldn't know that today We've been here for more than 400 years, and some folks are still coming over, as, as we know. But we, we do need border security, but we need sensible immigration uh, laws, or else our economy is going to stay behind. So that's the point I want to stress. We need capital capacity building, to, to Massey's point, and we need more contracts for our small businesses, because they truly run this country. Thank you. Ladies and gentlemen, wouldn't you agree that this was a very informative panel, a panelist that we had here today? And please give me a round of applause. Give them a round of applause for the great work that they do. Samuel, thank you. Um,